Selectman is returning from recess at 7.12 p.m. And we welcomed um, Mr. Kiros as our second finalist in the um, town administrator search. Um, our search committee met with you and forwarded your name along. And so this evening I'm just going to start. Um, you introduced yourself sure. to everyone on the board. So um, I guess the first question is why Millville? Why Millville? Well, um, you know, as you all know, um, I've had the, the honor and privilege of serving the legislature the last eight years uh, through January. Uh, the last six of those uh, years, I represented uh, your town. So, um, you know, being an Oxbridge resident, um, I, I clocked it. It is, I think, eight minutes door to door <laughs> from my home uh, to, to the office here. Um, obviously, um, regionally, uh, we want all towns to do well. Um, you know, a, a rising tide kind of raises all, all boats. And, uh, you know, going all the way back to, to many years ago when I was on the Board of Selectmen uh, in Uxbridge, um, we had gotten involved with uh, what was then the Four Town Selectmen Group. It was a pretty interesting group, actually, uh, which consisted of the selectmen from Uxbridge, uh, Sutton, Douglas, and Northbridge. And we were trying to work on some, some regional things. Um, you know, little did I know that, um, you know, I, I'd have the opportunity at one point to represent the town of Douglas uh, in, in the legislature as well as Uxbridge um, that when I was first elected and then after redistricting, um, picked up, you know, Millville, Blackstone, and, and Bellingham uh, for the latter six years of my, my term. So um, I've always been interested uh, in, in, you know, politics in, in the Blackstone Valley. Um, and, you know, I, I think I've, I've taken a pretty keen interest in your town uh, over the past six years. Um, I think what's important is to watch what someone does when no one is watching. You know, I, I think I was a pretty regular attendee at your town meetings to try to stay abreast of what was going on in town. Um, I always tried to make myself accessible uh, to anybody um, who, who called, either uh, constituents um, or, or any of you all. Um, every other month for eight years, um, I held office hours in each of the four towns uh, in my district. Um, sometimes you'd sit for an hour and literally not a single person would come in. Actually, more often than not, believe it or not. Yes, I, I believe yeah, that. Yeah, and, and I, I know you're doing it as well, so <laughs> you probably do experience that, you know. Um, but other times, you know, people come in, you know, we had someone come in one time uh, in, in this town uh, because beavers had, you know, dammed up uh, a stream and now what was a three-acre lot was now about a one-acre lot because of the, the beaver pond had, you know, had had taken mm -hmm. away, you know, some of their land, and they were asking if there's anything you know, that could be done. So, so, so y y y you get a keen interest in in a town when you spend, you know, time just meeting with the with the individual constituents mm -hmm. and make yourself available. So, uh, you know, I, I love your little town, and uh, as as a as a good neighbor, I'd, I'd like to, you know, you know, hopefully be helpful. I, I know you, there are a lot of struggles. Um, I think you've got a very important vote on uh, April first. That's going to chart, you know, a good bit of, of what's next for the town, mm -hmm. you know, and you know, I'll be watching that, you know, very closely. Thank you. Thank you. What do you see as one of the, the biggest uh, struggles, obstacles, or uh, situation that Melville's facing, and, and what are your thoughts about uh, bringing that to a head and or or working through it, I think, is a better word than bringing it to a head. Sure. Bringing, bringing, help guide uh, the town through the, that particular uh, Well, I mean, I, I think it's no secret or no surprise to anybody. Obviously, you know, the finances of the town um, are, are in a very difficult uh, place right now. You've got a very, you know, committed uh, group on your FinCom. Um, you all are very committed to the process um, during the last cycle. Uh, you know, there was a lot of information came out uh, trying to, you know, uh, paint the picture of how did you get to where you are today, you know, use of one-time revenues, those types of things. Um, you know, and the, the, another challenge that the town is faced with, honestly, is, you know, there, there's not a very diverse revenue stream. It's, you know, almost exclusively uh, property tax, okay? You know, um, and, you know single, and, and mostly single-family homes. You know, um, which, what do they do? They put kids in the school system, which, you know, becomes a burden. So, you know, something I shared with the, with the selection committee is um, I think it would be important for the town 
to pursue um, maybe senior housing um, opportunities, you know, partner with, with companies that specialize, or developers that specialize in, in developing senior um, housing, because they tend to be revenue positive for a town. Okay? They don't put kids in the schools. Um, yes, th th there might be a higher uh, number, incidence of you know, ambulance calls, those types of things, but um, typically those are you know paid by insurance and actually uh, you know your 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 ambulance you know probably spins off profits so mm -hmm. to speak I mean you don't view it that way but it's self sustaining through an enterprise fund usually you know so so something I shared with the with the selection uh, committee was you know I, I'd like to see the town um, embrace you know uh, senior uh, you know, developments to see if if that's a, a long term solution this is not a, that's not a band aid that you know you're going to put on tomorrow. But it, it certainly addresses the long-term need. Um, but something, that the, a Band-Aid that you do need to put on tomorrow to even make that happen um, would be to, to focus on making sure that the senior center is viable because how do you convince uh, a developer to put uh, a senior development in your town uh, when you're struggling to keep the doors open uh, on your senior center? So, so you know, th th these are all kind of, you know, it's, it's like a water balloon. You squeeze one side, the other side bulges out a little bit. But... Uh, you know, I mean, that, 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 that's one area. Um, the, the other area is more blocking and tackling. It's not even so much just a revenue thing, is, you know, the whole topic of the audit. You know, and it's, it's you know, it's probably been beat, beaten to death. But, you know, it, it, it was very surprising when I learned that, you know, the, the last audit was fiscal year 15, 15. 2015. You know, um, I had received a couple of phone calls uh, in my role as state representative uh, last year uh, for people who were asking questions about the audits. And, and honestly, at that point, I, I wasn't aware that audits weren't required of every town. Um, and I had looked into it, and I, I spoke with uh, the you know, Department of, of Local Services, and, and, and they shared with me uh, mm -hmm. the metric that unless you get you know, a certain amount of federal money, which mm -hmm. you have to blow that, yeah. um, that it's not required. You know, um, it's just always been good practice, though. You know, so, so I, I was a bit surprised to, to hear that. Um, I know Senator Fatman and Rep Soder are you know, trying to work on getting some money uh, to, to help with an audit. Whether that money uh, comes to fruition or not, um, I think it's job one. I think it's something we got to do right away. Um, yeah. You know, you know I, I, I come from the private sector uh, mentality, and the company I work for always said that if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. You know, and, and I think your baseline audit is going to give you at least a starting point that you can start you know, managing a little bit better. Mm -hmm. okay. so. Timing is critical, however. I'm sorry? The timing is critical. It is, you know, it needs to happen yesterday, like like almost everything in, in, in the municipal world. But yeah, no, it, 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 you know, and, and obviously, um, depending on what happens uh, on April 1st and then subsequent, you know, in the town meeting mm -hmm. uh, relative to the override, obviously impacts all of that. Um, but it doesn't change the need to understand a baseline of where you are financially as a town. Yeah. Regardless, the audit has been paperwork everything has been being compiled for a few months because it is in the budget to be done yeah regardless, i watched what you select me meeting regard, uh, regardless of and, and I, I saw that what the, happens at the state level it's fantastic right. it's those papers have been lisa our treasurer has been collecting and preparing for that audit which is great yeah right. since like september mm -hmm. it was in our good. plan yeah yeah which mm -hmm. is which is really good right so, so what would be your approach in uh, dealing with the various departments' budgets and coordinating all of that to getting? So, so uh, honestly, on, on day one, I wouldn't change a thing. Um, it's not my style uh, it, to, to come in someplace and, and, and set off a neutron bomb and blow everything up. Um, I would want to schedule one-on-one uh, -on -one meetings with literally every town employee, and I, I do mean every town employee, um, to understand what they do. Mm -hmm. um, and hopefully... Um, every single one of them knows their job better than I know their job, as they should. You know, I'm, I, I don't need to be the smartest guy in the room. Um, I uh, like to surround myself with people who know their jobs very well. So, so the first thing is understand what everybody does, what, what the relative strengths and weaknesses are. Mm -hmm. um, sec second thing, uh, and, and I'll get back to, to the piece about, about yep. the department heads, but I would want to sit down right away with the Department of Local Services. Okay, or, or, I'm sorry, DLS, um, and find out specifically uh, what may be missing uh, from the reporting uh, from the town over the years. And, and you may already have all that information um, handy, but I think it's a good meeting to have uh, as well. Um, to get back to the 
the meeting with the department heads. Um, if you all would endorse it, um, I would want, I, I've always been a big proponent and I would ask your support uh, to go to zero based budgeting, which says, tell me why you need whatever the amount of money was that you had last year. Let's not start with the amount of money you had last year. Tell me why. Okay. Um, and I worked for a company for a bunch of years that um, our revenue stream was pretty annuity based. We would sell something and, and then we would you know, incur you know, recurring revenue for many years on a stream. We were on zero based budgeting even though we knew exactly what our, or more or less what our revenue stream was going to be um, you know, month to month. And it just got me some really good budgeting habits um, you know, by, by taking that hard look and, and trying to justify uh, and, and justifies a, a strong word. I mean, because you have to have tr faith that you know things have not been done frivolously. Particularly, I mean, you guys have have run in a pretty lean ship here in town. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, nothing should be out of bounds as far as taking a look at, at solving the problems that, that you all have. You know. So um, I, I do tend to be a consensus builder rather than uh, dictatorial. You mm -hmm. know, in, in, in my management style. Okay. Um, you know. It, if, if you take a look at uh, the town of Uxbridge, um, and um, I'm not sure you know, how closely you all followed Uxbridge politics over the years, but it was a town deeply divided um, over building a new high school. I mean, it was a 20-year um, battle. And I, I moved to town, and, and we very quickly saw both competing sides uh, building you know, a case why you should or you shouldn't build a new high school. Um, it was my board of selectmen to get that high school built after 20 years. You know, it was my board of selectmen that purchased the land. It was my board of selectmen that got it approved at town meeting. You know? So y y you don't do that without being able to build confidence uh, among people that you're providing good information. Um, and and y you do that partly by working with the subject matter experts, the school department, or whoever it may be. So, so I, I do tend to be a consensus builder. Um, but also would understand that you know, the, the manager is the manager as well. Can you um, explain how your previous experience can be uh, advantageous for Millville with respect to our regional school district? Uh, I mean, the, the regional schools are always tough. Um, when I was first elected to the legislature, um, I had the Dudley Charlton uh, Regional School District. Mm -hmm. and, and they had a lot of the same challenges um, as you all do, except for those towns are a lot closer in size uh, than your towns. Mm -hmm. so, so it was it was a little um, it was a little less you know David and Goliath right. type type situation. Um, the, the the challenge, quite honestly, and, and it's been a huge frustration point uh, of mine, is the state has not met its obligation uh, or even come close to it on transportation. You know, back back when the big push was on, hey, listen, small town, you really don't need to run your own school system. You know, regionalize. Trust us. Don't worry about that added transportation cost. You know, um, it, it's it's you know we'll cover that for you. That's not been true. You know, um, I, I think in my eight years in the legislature, uh, the highest we funded it was in the mid ninety percent, uh, and that was um, I believe my first term. And unfortunately, that's when the economy went really bad, and then Deval Patrick had to make some nine C cuts, and then it, it ended up not even being in the nineties after all. Mm -hmm. But you know. So, so, you know, p part of the issue is making sure that, that we're active um, advocates uh, with our legislative delegation uh, to talk about, you know, things like you know, regional transportation, um, circuit breaker, you know. Um, now, you guys have a great hire uh, in the superintendent, you know. Um, even though I, I was, you know, leaving the legislature and he had just, you know, just recently joined uh, the district. Um, I, I did have the opportunity to sit down with Mr. DeFalco or Dr. DeFalco, and uh, he's, I think he's sharp, and I think he's got a pretty good vision, mm -hmm. um, and I think he's incredibly approachable and, and, and very high energy. Mm -hmm. um, I tend to be a pretty high energy guy, so I, I would love to work with the superintendent and, and try to advocate, you know, for, for, for the schools. Mm -hmm. But, you know, um, I, I absolutely recognize the, the, the challenges. Um, I do understand, however, that, that there, there's, there's currently a project underway or, or a focus group that's looking at the overall, the, the agreement between the yeah. towns. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. And, and so, you know, I don't know in this role if I'd have a, you know, a participating role in that process or not. Um, but I certainly would be keenly interested on, on, on hearing, you know, what can be done. You know, I, I will say, um, having been a, a, an attendee of, you know, Blackstone Town meetings as well, 
um, as, as your own, um, there have been some statements made on town meeting floor that don't exactly sound like we're all partners, okay? And, which is frustrating, you know. And, and also, I, I've been at some selectman meetings, uh, and, and you know, and, and there was one in, in Blackstone a number of years ago where there's some, there some tension there, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and I think there needs to be, you know, a, a lot of mutual trust between the respective boards of selectmen, um, but also um, with the town managers. Um, I, I've actually got a very good relationship uh, with Mr. Keys from, from Blackstone. Um, I, I shared this with the, uh, with the selection committee, but um, when I was first elected to the legislature and then my district was changed, I picked up the three towns uh, in this area. Um, you know, my opponent that first cycle was the chairman of the board of selectmen in Blackstone. Okay? And, and so when I won that seat, um, I wasn't exactly welcomed with open arms into Blackstone Town Hall, as you can imagine. I mean, it's, it's human nature. You, you, know, you, you support the person that you know. Um, but over, over the last six years, I think we worked really hard on that to the point where when I announced that I was not going to seek re-election, um, Mr. Keyes approached me and said, hey, is there a chance your aide, Amanda, would move into the district and consider running for the seat? We've really enjoyed our interactions with your office and you know would like to, to continue that level of professionalism so, so I, I think that speaks to uh, the ability you know for, for us to kind of you know, turn a corner you know mm -hmm. um, when somebody lose some as far as relationships are concerned but you know I, I tend to be more of a consensus builder than, than anything else how are you with grants and grant writing and uh, yeah, so my involvement uh, in, in grant writing, uh, first of all, I think every department head needs to have that as part of their job description, mm -hmm. okay? Um, and if it's not already, um, it would be if, if I were writing the job descriptions. Um, not all uh, people are inclined to do well at that, you know, mm -hmm. you know people have various skill sets. Um, you know, I, I will share that um, my first term in the legislature, uh, I represented the town of Webster. They had a full-time grant writer. And I think they paid her, don't quote me on this, but you know, around $40,000 a year. And they, every year, would lead um, the district in the amount of grants because they had someone who was focused on it. And they still had the requirement of each of their department heads uh, writing grants, but then they had someone who did this professionally, read through them, smooth them, whatever. Okay. Um, my exposure uh, with, with you know grant development has been more as, as as an advocate and you know and arguing for support mm -hmm. and helping to build a justification. You know we did a, a very big grant uh, for the town of Uxbridge to expand the water and sewer up 16, uh, which would then allow us to essentially double the size of the senior development. Now I was talking about senior development mm -hmm. earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, I was constrained by the, the diameter of the, of the wastewater pipe, believe it or not. Um, and so by getting a MassWorks grant uh, to do that, we were able to build the case that this is going to mean X amount of additional revenue to the town of Oxbridge because we're now able to double the size of, of, of that, that development. Okay. So, you know, and as legislator, you know, we often get asked by our host communities um, to, you know, write letters of support, but also advocate with, you know, the folks at, you know, MassWorks, for example. Yeah. That's great. Thank you. So, what would be your approach in dealing w with the personnel of the town hall? How would, what's your management style in specific? Um, everybody says this, but I, I do have an open door policy, mm -hmm. um, and, and I would encourage that. Um, I, I do hope that people have a sense of urgency about everything they do. Um, the, the, the company I work for and that I grew up with, I, I spent nearly uh, 20 years in information and, and management technology, uh, uh, information technology and management consulting. And uh, the president of the company said, do everything you do with a sense of urgency. You know, we were a consulting firm, so we would, show, we would be guest employees of our clients. And uh, his message to us was always, if they start at 8, you get there at 7.45. If they leave at 5, you leave at 5.15. But the perception um, is that uh, geez, you know, someone comes in, and you were there when I got there, and you were still there when I left. These guys from you know, Computer Aid, they work really hard. Okay? So, so I think you lead by example is, is where I was going with, 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 to answer your question. Um, I, I tend to work hard. Um, I tend to be a pretty quick study, um, but I also uh, want to encourage people to bring ideas forward. Um, the worst thing 
uh, that any manager can do, in my opinion, is to surround themselves with yes people um, who just tell them what they want to hear. Um, I enjoy, I enjoy spirited debate and push, push back and debate. Um, I like programs like um, awarding, uh, uh, whatever, a gift certificate or something like that for the idea of the month, those types of things. Be because um, the only way you really improve things are by soliciting ideas from people who do those jobs every day. You, know, you can't, as a town administrator, claim to know everything there is to know about DPW. If you do, you're, you're being dishonest. You know, but there's someone in DPW that can tell you how they can make their job better. So, so you know, I tend to be very collaborative. Um, the other thing I will share with you is if you were to take a kind of a survey or, or a poll across legislators, uh, we tend to be a bunch of type A personalities, very difficult to work for. And you tend to burn through uh, legislative aides pretty quickly, um, you know, six months a year, that kind of thing. Um, my last aide worked for me for almost six years. You know, so, so I think it's, its statement is to, is to you know, hopefully people like to work with me. You know, and, and, and maybe Amanda was an anomaly and, and uh, it was as crazy as I am, I don't know. But um, we worked very well together and, and I think it's indicative of just her longevity in, in an industry where people just turn to kind of flip like very quickly in that. In that. Given the um, financial strain on the town right now, how do you foresee the town administrator improving the situation? Uh, you know, and, and my predecessor did a good job with, with grant development and, and, and working through that. So I, I think we would continue down that path. We'd already talked a little bit about, I'd like to make that a component of at literally every department mm -hmm. head's, uh, um, you know, uh, strategy and, and what, what they're focused on. Um, other than that, be, obviously, you need to explore other revenue streams besides just property tax. Mm -hmm. You know, um, we'd mentioned you know senior housing. Um, I, I know you all are exploring cannabis right now. Mm -hmm. um, you know, my hometown just opened up the first woman-owned mm -hmm. cannabis facility in in the Commonwealth. You know, um, you know uh, the, the the first cannabis operation in the state uh, was in Leicester. One of the first two that opened on on, on the day that they were authorized. The town manager in Leicester was the town manager that I worked with for a couple of years. So I would be able to, I think, leverage kind of what did you learn in this process type questions. So between, I think, what, what we can learn from Oxbridge, what we could learn from Leicester, where I've got personal relationships in both places, I think that could position us very well um, to, to kind of exploit uh, cannabis. You know, it's, and, and, and believe me, I totally get the fact that it's, you know, it's controversial and everybody gets that. Um, but it's going to happen. Um, you know, in many places in the state, and do, do you sit by and, and let it happen everywhere but your town, or do you explore what makes sense for your town and, and the, the associated revenue stream? So, so there are two ideas right there. Mm -hmm. the, um, you know, and, and the other is, you know, I'm not sure how active your economic development uh, committee uh, is in town, mm -hmm. um, but it should be. Um, when I first got to Oxbridge, the, uh, the economic development committee, I learned um, was essentially a, a scouting committee on like which businesses do we want to keep out of Uxbridge? You know, with the people that I think a lot of people that were serving on it were on it for the wrong reason. They were trying to find out, okay, who wants to come to Uxbridge, and how do we remain, you know, kind of a you know a quiet, you know, uh, you know, rural town. Um, to me, that's not the, the the role of the economic development committee. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's the exact opposite is to recruit, to be a cheerleader for the town, mm -hmm. right? So. I will let you know about our economic development committee. Okay. There is not one. Okay. So that will pr um, bring me into my next question. How do we bring people in to serve on committees that we have openings on? You, you know, Jen. Um, and I, not even just new ones. No, just no, the ones I, we have. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's such a challenge to get people involved civically mm -hmm. right now. Yeah. Um, I, I wish I had a silver bullet answer for you. I, I don't. You know, I mean, you at least have contested elections. Um, for the most part, you know, Oxbridge right now, we have two selectman seats coming up. We have two candidates. We have three seats coming up on the school committee. We've got one candidate declared right now. So, so, so people, you know, are, are really shying away from it. And, and honestly, part of it is, I think, because of the discourse that, that we have, you know, community to, to boards, boards to communities. Um, you know, we had, you know, pretty ugly situation in my town of Oxbridge over, you know, what people were calling dirty dirt. 
you know, it was, it was very contentious. And, and, and there were a group of citizens who would show up every night or every other Monday night at the selectmen's meetings and let the board, you know, know how strongly they felt about, you know, mm -hmm. an operation. Um, and it got very testy, you know, and, and so that's the challenge is, is we got to make sure that ma we're maintaining the level of discourse that I think that we all want to have um, to encourage more people to get involved. Um, the second thing is, um, is take people seriously when they do volunteer, you know, um, and I, I'll, I'll tell you like a big mistake I made uh, when I was on the Board of Selectmen and in uh, uh, full disclosure, we had a group um, come together uh, to explore trash collection and they, um, they ultimately came down to, we want to do a pay as you throw program, okay, where um, you could, um, it, or, if, to participate in the program, you had to buy the bags, you know, for the family, you, you're all familiar with that, right? So um, when I was on the board, um, I voted against implementing it or even allowing it to be implemented because it was an opt-out program rather than an opt-in program as, as it was architected. In hindsight, I wish I would have let it go through and, you know, and the better way to handle that would have been to just say, listen, we want everybody to know that unless you opt out, you are going to be in this program. Okay, um, to me that, that that you know, looking back on it, that was not a reason to, to stop it from happening. So here we are, like ten years later, actually almost fifteen years later. Now I think they're, they're doing it again, and um, it will be uh, an opt-in program, which is which is is nice. Um, but those are the types of things you you learn is um, sometimes your values um, aren't necessarily um, what's important. Um, you know, and, and you need to let the community decide. You know, uh, at one point we we're on the board of select. When I was on the board of selectmen, we were in uh, the, the discussion about an override, um, and I had looked under the covers enough at the numbers to feel that we, I, I didn't think we really needed it. Okay, um, I voted, however, to set the ballot election to let the town weigh in on. Mm -hmm. You know, because my sense was um, I could advocate from the selectmen table. You're on TV every other Monday night. You know, and you can advocate the reasons why you feel you should or should not have it, but I was not going to do a procedural move um, and block, uh, you know, the, the town weighing in on it as, as a whole. And, and I think you know, it's incumbent upon all of you and, and the town manager and FinCom to build a case that says, okay, here's what the town looks like with an override, and here's what it looks like without an override, and you all make the decision on how you want to define what the town looks like. You know, and then all of us then react and adapt to whatever the town says. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you, you mentioned uh, there's disc potential discourse, and but how do you handle that type of, of situation when there is discourse, and uh, especially as a town mm -hmm. uh, manager, town administrator, um, you're probably the most visible mm -hmm. and accessible uh, person in the town. So, so I mean, first, what I'll share is, um, if you were to talk to my colleagues in the legislature, mm -hmm. I think they would say I was more of a policy wonk than a grandstander. You know, like I, yeah. I, I, I don't need it to be about me. Um, you're more likely to get to a solution. You don't care who gets credit for it. You know, and and it almost sounds like a platitude, but I mean, I really do feel that way. Mm -hmm. Let's you know, get stuff done. So. I, I don't need to be that person who is out front and center. Um, I'd, I'd much rather surround myself with people who are going to get the job done and work together. Um, having said that, though, I, I think, um, you know, having spent eight years in the legislature, it's no secret. I was a member of the minority party uh, in a state that was, you know, that is 80 percent um, Democrat, you know, and I, I think I could literally probably call 160 out of 160 of my colleagues if I ever need a favor or anything else. Because what you learn very quickly in the legislature is on this particular bill, Tom, you and I are enemies. The very next bill that hits the docket, right. we're co sponsors. Right. Right. You know, and, and so you find a way to work together on things, um, and it's, it's topical, it's not personal. Mm -hmm. And, and that's what is so difficult because you've all been subject to attacks, you know, and social media makes it so much easier. Everybody's a keyboard warrior. Um, you get that, you know, and it's part of the job. Um, you, you don't interview for a position like this if you have thin skin. At least I hope you don't. Um, you, you won't last long in, in, in the business. Um, I, don't, I don't think you run for the legislature 
uh, if you have a thin skin. Mm. You know, um, some may, you know, are thinner than others, but um, yeah. yeah. So I, I, I think I, I've shown over the years that, that I have the composure to handle myself in difficult situations. And also, you know, you win some, you lose some, and, you know, and, and I certainly can, can handle that, I think. Yeah. Oh, great. Yeah. Appreciate that. Thank you. So, Kevin, day one, yeah. you're working here. Yeah. What's your day going to be like? <laughs> day one, we start, you know, I, hopefully I meet everybody in town hall, spend some time doing that. Uh, but then, you know, we start scheduling um, interviews right away with everybody to, to, to do a baseline of what does everybody do. Um, because you're gauging people not only their knowledge of their job, but you also can get a sense within the first five minutes whether they like their job or not. You know, and it's really um, that you get a lot more productivity out of people who like their jobs and they like the work environment and all that. So, so I mean, that that would be you know day one. Um, you know, short term is I think we need to work through. Uh, first, we need to find out what happens. You know, April first, and that'll be before the position. This position is even filled, but um, y you work through uh, the outcome of that um, and how that is going to impact the budget, either you know positively or negatively, moving forward. So, you know, parallel to that is working through the, the audit issues, whether it's funded with some seed money uh, from from the state or whether we find a way to do that. You, you got to do that um, as soon as possible after. After starting, I would want to sit down uh, with you know with, with DLS and and really get a sense for okay where are we deficient in what we report. And obviously, you've got to be able to certify free cash. You've got to be able to close the books, uh, and and you know all all the blocking and tackling aspects um, of the job um, need to be squared away to make sure that we're doing everything that statutorily we're required to do, but also that we should be doing uh, from a good management perspective. Yeah, um, you know, I I. I Jumped into situations professionally, um, literally hundreds, hundreds of times. Um, working in consulting, um, you show up day one, you know nothing about their industry, but you happen to know a little bit about information technology or process management or those types of things. You immediately try finding ways to improve processes. So, so the company I worked for for all those years, that's what we did. We would go into businesses, take a look at the way they did things, uh, and make recommendations on how to improve them. Sometimes it, you know, it u utilized technology. Other times it was just process changes. It was better documentation. It was, you know, what you need to make resource changes. You don't. You've got round pegs in square holes. Those types of things. So, um, you know, I, I get experience and kind of hitting the ground running pretty quickly. Um, and what's really fascinating about working in consulting is the breadth of exposure you get. I mean, I personally have worked. Uh, consulting with manufacturing and financial services and healthcare and uh, theaters and you know education and, and all that, so, so we're all a collection of kind of our, our the, par the path our our lives took. And I, I think I bring a you know, pretty broad perspective on things. I don't have all the answers, obviously not. You know, how would this balance with uh, your your present? Uh, Commitment of work that you do consulting and that kind of thing. Well, so I'm You're retired from consulting. You're retired from okay. Yeah, no, I, I am retired from consulting. Real estate. Um, I, I do real estate. I'm a, I'm, I'm a, a, a co-owner of a small real estate company. Um, what I tend to do is um, is focus on listings as opposed to you know helping people find homes. So essentially, if y'all understand real estate, and I'm sure y'all do. Um, listing, you know, you, you, you filled in calls and scheduling showings, mm -hmm. you know, um, which is not time intense, you know, uh, being a buyer's agent where you're taking someone around showing them a dozen homes, uh, is, is a big deal, you know, so, um, you know, if, if we were to move forward together, um, we would certainly need to talk about that, but, um, as, as a co-owner of a company for, for over, over a decade. Um, I, you know, I wouldn't look to walk away from that. Um, I managed to very successfully um, do both while I was in the legislature. And again, it's because I tend to focus on the listing side of things and not working as a buyer's agent, which is just incredibly time consuming. Yeah. 
Kevin, since we're on the um, topic of you being a real estate yeah. agent um, or owner of a yeah. real estate, how would you proceed with our old town hall? Wow. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, that, that's that, that's a sixty-four thousand dollar question. Um, you know, I heard some talk just, just recently too. I it might have just been right out, out here about a lot of the records are still in town hall, mm -hmm. and my understanding is it's not accessible unless you have a hard hat on, right? I mean, you, you right. literally more or less cannot They're get in a storage. Yeah, they've been removed from the old town hall. They're in a storage unit. Oh, they are now, okay. Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. that, 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 yeah. that's helpful. Yes, because it's been closed up in the air quality and other qualities sure. that okay. come with a closed, yeah. closed yeah. space, that, so yeah. Okay. The renters. Yeah, right, right, right. right. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know how much y'all have done this or, or my predecessor had, had done this, but um, you may want to explore, um, can the building be revitalized by a third party? Mm -hmm. Give an example. Um, are you familiar with um, downtown Webster, uh, where the town hall is in, in Webster? Mm -hmm. So attached to town hall is a school mm -hmm. that sat vacant for probably 30 years, maybe more. And I've been through that a number of times. Uh, and and they, they partnered with a business uh, called NOAA. And I don't know what the acronym stands for. But essentially, they revitalize old uh, municipal buildings into apartments, and and so so they built affordable um, units there for seniors, and then they relocated the senior center from an older building into the what was the gymnasium of the of the school that was attached to the mm -hmm. town hall. So so I think you'd want to you know explore that. Um, you know I've leveraged that relationship that I built with Noah. Uh, Uxbridge took a their middle school offline last year okay so, so what was the old high school on Cape Run Street is now offline um, I was able to bring them in to do an assessment there no cost to the town uh, to see if that was a property that they'd be interested in revitalizing so I, I think you need to explore some some of those issues uh, or, or, or opportunities I'm sorry we do have an old study okay, on the town hall. okay. well the Urban Institute looked yeah. at a couple prior to that right prior right. to that too yeah. okay yeah. So, so I mean, that, that, that's that's an opportunity. Um, but beyond that, I, I think the town needs a long-term strategy on if nothing like that presents itself that's going to find a way to reuse that building. Because you hate to lose it because it's, it has such historical significance. And it is a, a beautiful building. Um, it's just not safe. Um, you know, if we're able to retain it, that would be, you know, the preferred solution but if not then I think you need to plan on what do you do with it long term right. relative to dem demolition and, and everything else so I even hate to use the word demolition because it's I mean but you need to do one or the other I need to either find out what the next use is or probably take it down so with that said you long-term goals what are your thoughts of the town's master plan um, you know I, I I can't say I read the entire thing. Um, I, okay. I, I, I did page through it quite a bit. Um, and I actually had some questions for you guys about that. Um, there were a number of, of uh, parcels of property um, identified uh, in, in the master plan. And uh, I, I had asked the selection committee um, a question on this was, you know, I, I saw it was just updated uh, fairly recently. It, was, it's, it might be an old plan, but it's fairly recently updated. Most of those, like you kind of pull them off the shelf, you blow the dust off of them, you know. Um, so, so I wanted to get a sense from y'all. It was a question I was going to ask you, actually, was, you know, how intent um, the town is with the master planning process or, or how intent you, stay, you intend to stay um, focused on using a master plan process. Um, because, for example, there are a, a number of parcels that are identified in there, but you also just sold off some parcels right. last year. Were any of the parcels that were sold part of that master plan? And if so, how does that dovetail? Are, are we already off track with the master plan if we sold parcels that were listed as op development opportunities? You know, so, so I think you need to reconcile some of that stuff. You know, um, planning is always a good thing. Uh, you know, I, I'd be very much in favor, and, and I think the requirement for the position is to have a five-year rolling plan for capital. Um, I think that's a great idea, and and if you don't, if that doesn't already exist on the shelf, I'd like to you know work on that. That would be a short-term um, goal as well. Um, you also need to be kind of smart about that. You know, we went through that process in Ashbridge. We did not have a long-term uh, capital plan, and we asked everybody um, what what their needs were for capital planning. Mm -hmm. And the list that was presented that was going to be voted on at town meeting as we're getting ready to set the warrant included an F-150 truck for the school department, an F-250 truck for DPW. No one asked the question until I asked it. 
Do we need two trucks? Is the utilization going to be 100% on these trucks? Or can we get by with one truck and schedule better? Mm -hmm. You know, those types of things. So, so I, th I think you need to be smart ab about these things as well. But um, I, you know, I, I'd love to take a, you know, a more thorough uh, read through the, the master plan. Um, and th there are resources available, like CMRPC will help you. Mm -hmm. With master planning, um, you know the, the original plan that Oxford did was done by uh, the, uh, the Eisenberg School uh, at UMass. I think helped uh, do that, and and those resources are available as well to keep those things up to date as well. And then you know it's helpful to the students who do it, um, yeah, and, and the towns they do it. For. And exactly right, right. So it, it's a win-win, mm -hmm. you know. And, and then, but it's not just students doing it. Um, it's w under the the guidance of a professor who's done urban planning and those types of things as well. So. What has been your most difficult budgeting decision you had to make that affected a general population? Um, I would say it was, it was difficult, but something we did uh, when I was on the Board of Selectmen in Uxbridge was um, we were struggling with building maintenance. And um, we'd gotten away as a town from every department putting a small component in their budget for maintenance and repairs to their facilities. So everything just got neglected because no one had the money in their budget to do it. Um, we brought the idea forward as a Board of Selectmen to advocate for an override for a couple hundred thousand dollars a year, specifically to fund a, a school and municipal building maintenance fund, okay? Um, and so that was you know, asking the voters to say, listen, we recognize we have capital needs, uh, you know, across the town. And then what we did with that then was, uh, and, and I think it was either 200000 or 300000 please forgive me for, for not an exact number, but that amount, you know, as any override, you can only earmark that for the first year of an override. Okay, overrides, you know, unlike that exclusions, overrides can be earmarked only for one year. So it required discipline. Uh, to continue to channel that extra 200k a year into that account. Right. Okay, um, we were insistent, um, even when we were faced with a lot of challenges, as you all are on no no department had enough money. Um, we were insistent on we the voters trusted us to do this, and we need to honor that commitment. Okay, um, so as long as I was involved in the budget process uh, from your table. Um, we were insistent that that money continue to flow into that account. It has since kind of just become part of the the operating budget. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm a little disappointed in that. You know, you can argue, well, should you do an underride for that money because it's no longer being used for the original intent. Mm -hmm. But that was a tough one, though, because um, there's there's one school of thought that says you just make sure every department head budgets this much of their budget for, you know, maintenance for their particular facility. Um, but it was a little bit easier for us to put together a pool of money. And then the town manager had the discretion in working with the department heads to whatever, you need to refinish the floors, you need to put a new roof on, you need to replace windows, those types of things, to make those decisions without it becoming you know, a major initiative because there was already was a pot of money mm -hmm. there to do that. Okay. Thank you. So you've had some business, you've had some town experience, mm -hmm. you've had state legislative um, experience. So how do you bring that all together um, and work within the kind mm -hmm. confines of um, municipal government and the, the the way that businesses run through the municipalities yeah, and yeah, master the law? No, that's a good question. You know, um, I, 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 I think. Um, I, I've shown professionally over, over my life the ability to adapt to things very quickly. I mean, the nature of working in mm -hmm. consulting success, successfully for 20 years, starting a branch of a consulting firm, uh, shows my ability to adapt to whatever the particular environment is. Um, you know, after leaving that business, I ended up working um, for the Department of Defense uh, in procurement um, at the Natick Labs. You know, and, and, and in that um, role, I'd never done uh, federal government purchasing before, um, and very shortly after uh, I was there, within months of me being there, um, they gave me a program uh, where we spent literally a quarter billion dollars uh, on 
on some devices that were going to be used in theater over in Iraq and, and Afghanistan. So um, he came from being kind of the, the new guy in the department as a consultant uh, to having a very important uh, project and um, you know meeting with vendors all over the country and those types of things. So, so I, I think I've been very adaptable as far as the environment that I've been in. Um, you know, I've, I've, I've got strong management experience. I've got strong, I think, municipal experience from your table um, with two terms on the Board of Selectmen in Uxbridge. And I've got the legislative experience and the relationships. Uh, so, um, and, and I think, the, you know, two other things I would bring to the table for you is I think my learning curve relative to Millville would be significantly shorter than almost any other candidate who, you know, probably applied for this position. Um, I, you know, I, I, I know y'all, um, you know, and, and, and I like the town, um, and I'm, I'm right down the road, um, and so, so I think I bring that to the table. And, and just, you know, in the overall picture, you know, and it's, it's a trivial point, but money is very important to the town right now. For example, if I were to, uh, if we were to move forward together, I would not need health care from the town, okay? So there would be, you know, significant financial savings from that perspective. I, I don't know what, you know, any others' uh, situations are, but I would not need health care from the town, which, you know, if you look at, you know, what the salary is, and typically you say it's a 30% burden typically for, for health care, mm -hmm. that's a significant savings. That's, that's half a person probably. Um, you know, in town hall that you'd be saving you know, because I, I wouldn't need health care if I, if I were to work with you guys. Mm -hmm. okay. So what are your thoughts on increasing the business presence in Millville? Um, I, I think you want to make sure that uh, you do a review of the bylaws, okay, to make sure that there's nothing that is inhibiting um, business from coming to town. Um, you can assume that there isn't, but I don't know that that's a safe assumption, you mm -hmm. know. Um, so I, I'd want to do a bylaw review to make sure. Uh, and, and part of what you do is you sit down with the same RPC and, and, you, and you say, you know, how do our bylaws compare to other smaller towns? Mm -hmm. um, you know, the second thing you do is you make it as easy as possible for businesses to come to town. So you put together a packet. A lot of times you walk in and you're like, okay, I want to open a business in Millville. Here's the packet. Here's you know the forms that you need to fill out. Here's who you talk to uh, in zoning. Here's the schedule uh, for when the ZBA uh, meets. Here's the schedule for when the planning board meets. Here's what you're going to need to do. Here's the process. Uh, make it as easy as possible because the last thing uh, someone who's starting a business wants to do is worry about the minutia. Mm -hmm. You know, for a town, they want the, the town needs to be an active partner in trying to make a lot of those problems go away. You know, so, so I, I think that's, that's something you do. Um, I'd love to see an economic development committee, you know, but the right kind, you know, not the scouting committee that finds out what business to keep out of Millville, but rather the, the, the recruiting, you know, arm of that to, to try to bring businesses in, mm -hmm. uh, you know. And, and, and I think also being responsive. You know, um, when I was on the board of Secretary in Oxbridge, we were the second um, community in the entire Commonwealth who adopted an expedited permitting site uh, which says, you know, that if a business were to apply here, that we would turn around, uh, you know, any permitting decisions, I think it was within 90 days, okay? That says a lot, you know? Um, and, and that's why there was tremendous growth uh, in North Carolina over the years, was down in Research Triangle down there, they would give businesses a thumbs up or a thumbs down in 60 days on whether or not you can open a plant. You know, I, I talked to an executive once who was in the chemical industry, he said it took seven years to get his permitting done in Massachusetts. He went down to North Carolina and they, they turned him down, um, but he knew that in 60 days. He needed to spend seven years of attorney fees and engineering mm -hmm. fees and all that kind of stuff. You know? so, so I think you, you need to try to be as hospitable as possible to, to businesses to, you know, to make, make their lives easier. And you know, the other thing I will share is people can deal with bad news um, if it's given, you know, calmly, um, honestly, um, and uh, to the point. And, you know, the only thing worse than bad news is surprise bad news, you know? And, and, and so I'm, I'm okay with, you know, you all need to hear bad news, um, but honest bad news, you know? And um, sometimes getting back to business right away and say, you know what, this probably isn't a way that we're gonna get your business into, you know, our town. Oxbridge has a no power plant bylaw, for example. 
So, you know, uh, a business came to town a year or so ago, they wanted to put a peaking plant in, similar to what's in Blackstone, where it only runs when there's really, you know, peak demand. And the answer, you know, had to be to that business, unless we do a bylaw change, which, you know, I all know how long those can take, um, you know, it wasn't going to be a fit for the town. Yeah. So. Just as a follow-up, how yeah. much um, experience have you had with um, uh, bylaws and zoning bylaws and... Uh, what comes with all of yeah, that? Yeah, we actually um, uh, received a grant when I was on the Board of Selectmen uh, from the Commonwealth to recodify our, bylaw, our bylaws. Um, and initially, it was, it was the best thing since sliced bread, okay, until um, you, you realize that anytime you're taking something that's been developed in layers over mm -hmm. 50 years, uh, and, you, and you try to start with a clean whiteboard, you know, there were some broken references, you, it referred back to, you know. Um, so, so I would tread cautiously uh, if you go through that type of exercise. Um, but, but we had actually, we, had, we got a grant from the state uh, to bring in a specialist who did this type of thing. Um, and then subsequent to that, there's been some fallout uh, in town. You know, our, our table of use, uh, you know, is, is un unclear. To this point, you would think after recodifying your bylaws that you clarify things like your table of use, not introduce more, um, more problems. You know, um, so yeah, I've you know again, I'm, I'm kind of policy wonkish. Um, you know, most people are bored to tears by that stuff. I kind of find it interesting. You know, maybe I'm kind of weird like that, but mm -hmm. you know, somebody's got to do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, like I don't get excited about it, but, yeah. but, but I mean, I find it interesting, you know, and, and I've always found, you know, public policy interesting, you know. And, better to yeah. find it interesting than burdensome, so. Yeah, yeah. So as we talk about um, some of those things, you've talked about, you know, dirty dirt and Uxbridge yeah. and, and water cables and power plants and by the river. And, yeah. um, what is your experience in, um, in regards to environmental issues? An so, so as you know, I mean, you, you guys had something pretty significant uh, on on Central Central Ave um, uh, last couple of years. You know, sorry, the, Central Street. I'm sorry, Central Street. Yeah, um, and and that got kind of kind of sticky because um, it was unclear what the source of that contamination was. So um, actually, you know, we literally would do probably biweekly or monthly at at worst. Uh, status calls with DEP. Um, Mary Jude Pigsley is the regional director uh, for DEP, and I've gotten to know Mary Jude pretty well over the over the last five years, dealing with the dirty dirt issues in Uxbridge and then the contamination here, um, which uh, which got very difficult, as you all know, um, because since it spanned state lines, you had to deal with Rhode Island's version of uh, the DEP. Um, and then you had the EPA sitting on top of all of it because it was a multi-state uh, problem, you know. So um, we've been involved, you know, quite a bit. Um, when, when I had uh, the constituent reach out um, relative to the beaver issue, um, you know, we had to, you know, work with, you know, uh, conservation to see if is there any solution there. And, and it's so funny, as, as a state rep and as selectman, you learn a lot of, about stuff that you never thought you'd learn anything about, <laughs> you know. I mean, I learned that there was something called a beaver deceiver, okay? Mm -hmm. And that the reason that beavers dam is because they hear rushing water and that's what drives them to dam. So you put something in that makes the water flow smoothly. They don't hear that. It deceives them. They don't need to build a dam. Everything's good, right? So I was told that a beaver deceiver was installed here and within like a couple weeks, the beavers had eaten it. So, um, so you know. But these are things you learn um, <laughs> that you never thought you'd have, the, you know, the opportunity to experience. But, you know, that, so I, I, I did, to answer your question, though, Jen, I, I've got a really solid relationship uh, with Mary Jude Pigsley, who is the top environmental, um, you know, resource uh, in Central Mass. Also, um, the Secretary of Energy and Environment, Matt Beaton, uh, he and I were legislative classmates. So, so we served together uh, two terms in the legislature. Um, and... It was interesting when um, when the, the, the quote-unquote dirty dirt issue reared its head in Uxbridge, um, I was able to call Matt, and I said, Matt, I, I just want two things from you. I want a commitment that DEP won't be on the critical path on 
anything that needs to be negotiated between the town because we're, we're trying to get some monitoring agreements put in place. I'm like, please tell me you'll commit enough resources that DEP won't be on the critical path to get this done. He goes, okay, we'll do that. And I said, and the second thing is, if you find anything, you know, bad happening, that you wield the full enforcement authority of DEP. He goes, Kevin, that's what we do. You know, he said, uh, you know, people are more upset when we declare a Superfund site in their basement when they have an oil spill than, than us not taking action. You know, he said, so, he goes, you got my commitment that, that we'll, we'll, you know, treat this very seriously, you know. So that gave me a level of assurance that the top environmental executive in the Commonwealth and also in Central Mass were both focused on, on the towns in my district, yeah. Anyone else around the table? So how would you deal with um, residents coming in with their complaints? Um, I mean, I, I, I would like to try um, office hours. Uh, you know, obviously not restrict people from only coming in to see you during that time, but to make yourself available because, you know, people who work, you know, nine to five jobs can't get in when town hall is open. So you want to make yourself available in the evening. So like when I did my office hours every other month, uh, for eight years, uh, we would stagger them. Sometimes we would do them at the senior centers during the business day, uh, but then you miss out on people who you know work nine to five because they, they can't come in. If you do them in the evenings, a lot of times the seniors would not want to come out you know at night. And those so so it, it was a blend. But you had to rotate them. So I certainly would love to do that. Um, make yourself available. Um, you know, I, I, I tend to be pretty accessible, you know, via cell phone, uh, email, et cetera, pretty responsive for the most part. Um, so, you know, in the end, Jen, you said yourself that you don't get a whole lot of, you know, people coming in. Um, but uh, Not to office hours. Yeah, right, right. But people do like to email or phone call. Okay, sure. Let's just show up. Show up yeah, during no, the day well, wanting to speak to you. Right. No, I, I think the other thing that, that you'll find, too, over time is people are willing to pay for good government. And government is accessible and, resp and responsive. I think people are okay paying for that. Uh, I think when when people feel the government is not responsive to them is when they get upset. You know? and, and so you know we all work for the town, not the other way around. Yeah. So what do you th see as your position, uh, as the position or the role of the town administrator? What, what do you think? that entails for you to with in relation to citizens and to the board of selectmen um, yeah sometimes you have to play referee to be honest you know uh, and that's okay because I mean people are most passionate about things that are closest to them you know as you'll find it's just human nature and if you've got something that is impactful to your life um, you can be upset about that you know um, so, so I think part of uh, a town administrator or town manager's uh, role um, is to be that filter um, and, and, and to be the, the referee, so to speak. And, and I, don't, I don't mean in a negative way, but you know what I mean? But because y you all as selectmen um, have to advocate for the community as a whole. Mm -hmm. So in aggregate, this is the policy that we need to implement for the community as a whole. That may or may not affect me positively individually. Uh -huh. And so it's 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 your jobs to make sure that you've got sound policy in place that are good for the community as a whole. That does not mean, and nor can we ever expect it to be fair and equitable and you know acceptable to everybody. And there are going to be a lot of upset people. It's uh, especially small towns. I mean, we all we all know what it's like. I mean, you know. Um, so, so you know, part of it is is being an intermediary, and part of it is being being able to 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 share. Again, as I said, bad news if if that's what it takes. Or, and I I, I shouldn't use the negative and say bad news, but share direct news with people. You know? yeah. And the other thing I, I will add, Andrew, is one of my biggest frustrations um, as a legislator um, are the constituent cases that you can't resolve because mm -hmm. there's some of them just cannot be resolved. You know, and and you feel bad, and you you you, you swing and miss sometimes, and, and you try very hard, but you know you, you can't solve everyone's mm -hmm. issue, and 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 uh, and that's something that I struggle with to this day still. Where you know, cause it was funny. I, I was with uh, my former aide just uh, recently, and we were talking about a couple of cases. 
really wish we could have helped so and so, you know, and and uh, and she called me the other day, and, she, you know, and and you know, she was like, you know, have you been following what's going on with these cases, those types of things? So you can't help everybody. You try, you know, and, and you take an honest effort. You know. Um, and the other thing you do is, you know, you try to refer people to other agencies where they can get help, because mm -hmm. not everything is the town's responsibility to solve either. It can be state agencies or federal agencies um, that are available as well. Um, so we talked about your first day, but we all know that there's a financial mm -hmm. issue in town. So what are the what is your first? I think it was asked earlier. Your first mm -hmm. look. What do you what do you do for that specific mm -hmm. item? Um, so. And it's, it's almost irrelevant whether the override passes or not. And I don't say that lightly. I, I just mean you take the same approach whether it's there or not. Um, is you, you need to find how to best apportion the limited funds that are available. Because even if the override passes, there's still limited funds that are available. It's just a larger amount of limited funds that are available. Um, something we did in, in, in Oxbridge that was tremendously helpful was we actually put in place uh, from the Board of Selectmen uh, and... FinCom working together uh, in the school department actually a revenue sharing agreement where we baseline the budgets took an average of, over a couple of years baseline the budgets and then that was the percentage of the overall operating budget that would be apportioned to um, the, to each department so for example if a new business came in town that was going to spin off two hundred thousand dollars a year and I'm making these numbers up but say it was a two to one split mm -hmm. you know uh, you know two thirds to the schools one third to the municipal whatever so if a new business came in that was going to generate three hundred thousand dollars a year uh, in additional revenue we would earmark two hundred of that to the school budget and a hundred of that to the municipal budget mm -hmm. um, what that helped us avoid were really really ugly town meetings it used to be incredibly ugly, you know, pitting departments against each other on town meeting floor. And I've been to enough of your town meetings that that doesn't really happen here too much, and you're fortunate. Um, I've been to enough town meetings in, in my life, though, to see that it does happen. Um, and the last thing you want is, is to pit departments against each other. You understand their needs, hopefully by zero-based budgeting. Um, you negotiate disagreements, um, and you make the tough decisions. But I mean, I, I would encourage you all to, to at least consider looking at a revenue sharing agreement uh, between, and it's a little bit more complex because as part of a regional you know, mm -hmm. school district, it makes it a little bit tougher yeah. to, to do that. Yeah. Is there any other questions? Yes. Um, so you mentioned zero-based budgeting. Mm -hmm. um, how would you implement that for the town? I mean, it's it's a fairly simple con mm -hmm. you know, well, concept. Is you, basically you start at zero for your budget and, and tell me what you need, um, and and justify um, you know every cent that's in your budget. Um, and it's not meant to be painful, and, and it really shouldn't be painful because it should be information you have in front of you. Mm -hmm. But when your assumption is that the amount of money I spent last year was the right amount of money, mm -hmm. and we're going to bump that up two and a half percent automatically because that's what we spent last year. I don't know that that's a safe assumption, that the amount of money we spent in any one area is the right amount of money. It could have been too much. It could have been not enough. Mm -hmm. you know? um, so, so uh, you know, I, I think you have a session with department heads to talk about the concept of zero-based budgeting, uh, understand what you're looking for from it, um, and then have them come in with a draft of here's what I think I need but if nothing else if it just changes the way people think about budgeting their department a little bit I think you've, you've gained something there that you know our starting point is not what we spent last year yeah. that's easy that's too easy mm -hmm. you know in my opinion so um, yeah. my thing was mainly on the um, not so much the how you would go about specific, specifically doing it but how you would implement it in a uh, policy way like how would would you look to have it as a written policy or would you want it more of like a understood policy like well, that type and, of, and uh, you are the policy setting board so mm -hmm. you know, I would defer to your table you know, for that whether it's something you wanted me to pursue um, I can make recommendations mm -hmm. as to I think it's a good strategy you can either accept that notion mm -hmm. or reject it you know mm -hmm. and obviously you know I, I would report to the five of you so mm -hmm. um, 
you know, it's my job to implement kind of your strategy, but I, I would offer that as something I would like to do. And whether you agree with me or not, it's, you know, that's why you have selectman meetings to debate that stuff. Right. Yeah. Okay. Is there any other questions from the board? So just as, um, is there anything that we haven't touched upon that you would like to share, tell us about, or maybe um, give? further insight to no, no I, I think the only commentary um, I would provide to you all is relative to last year's um, debate um, over the override um, and the only reason I share this is because my office got a lot of phone calls um, you know from residents in the town that were both pro override and uh, anti override and I, I think the, the MO was very much as new information became available, you immediately provided it to uh, the community as a whole, um, which on its surface is a good strategy. However, I heard from a number of people who said, we don't know, this is a moving target. We don't know whether it's 1.8 or 1.6 or 1.4 or 1.9 or whatever and, 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 and all that. Um, and the interest of sharing as much information as possible um, might have clouded, you know, the perception of, of people. And again, I, I just share this as just what I heard as mm -hmm. a quote unquote neutral party, you know, who heard from both people who were both pro override and I heard the same thing the same thing. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So, so you know, I, I, I think that would be, you know, a piece of, of commentary, whether it's advice or not, it's just, I think it's, you know, a, a look back. Um, I'm much more into looking forward than, than back. Um, but, you know, be able to back up your numbers, you know, build confidence in the community and, and let the community decide um, on what we want the town to look like. Don't have the decision based on whether we trust the information we're given or not. Okay. So, because that's a very different discussion that you have. Mm -hmm. You know, if you don't trust the information, um, you're going to typically vote no always. Like, you know, whenever town meeting floor there is all of a sudden a eight page change to a bylaw submitted on town meeting floor that's going to fail you know not nine, 99 times out of 100 because there's just not the trust that it was a moderator wouldn't accept that okay, okay. <laughs> i i already did an expert no. a few years ago it, it caused a problem for no us, it, you know? it could it yeah could. yeah you know what i mean um so so making making a decision based on uncertainty is different than looking at two different visions for the town and consciously deciding if I pay X, here's what the town looks like. If I pay Y, mm -hmm. here's what the town looks like. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, it's the job of the collective team, FinCom, you all, the town administrator, you know, the regional school district, everyone to say, here are those two different visions. You all decide, community, what you want the town to look like. You know? And I think as long as you're able to justify it, then, then people are gonna make their, their choice. You may or may not agree with the choice that's made, mm -hmm. Because um, you know what you learn being an elected official is you know there's always roughly 50% of the people disagree with you so um, that's that's the nature of what we all do um, but you know I, I would just differentiate that that there's two reasons people make decisions and let's hope they make it based on what they see as the two options for the vision as opposed to being uncomfortable with the information so, if that's worth anything to you. So. Great. Yeah. All right, so our timeline going forward is that um, after we uh, finish up with you, we're gonna take a, a recess and then we're gonna come back to the table to discuss whether or not we're gonna pursue either candidate, um, how that will look. So um, before the end of the evening, I will email you okay. um, and let you know what the decision of the board was, <coughs> if we did select or if we're, if we're moving out for a later discussion okay. point. Um, sure. It's at the board's discretion. Um, so I will let you know um, this evening where we stand um, okay. for the meeting, and then we'll go forward from there for whatever the outcome is. Okay, fair enough. And you would ask, you know, th th that I not show up um, for the prime meeting, and yep. I, I honor that request. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I just think the, yeah, I think it's only is only fair the integrity of the yeah. interview process, yeah, and yeah, I appreciate exactly. that. Yeah, Thank yeah. you. Yeah. So, so I mean, you know, it, it seems like y'all have done a thorough job. Um, you know, I, I, I. I had the pleasure of meeting with the selection you know committee a few weeks ago and 
you know, it's it's always uh, interesting when you interview with like eleven people and you know, it's, it's five. <laughs> you know. Interesting is a good way to put it. Yeah, you know. <laughs> we didn't turn anyone away, so that yeah. was a good thing. No, oh, yeah, and they well, were a great group, and oh yeah, they really crossed their T's and dotted their well, I's. And, and, and I think it's a, a good cross section of, of the community too, mm -hmm. as far as people who are newer to town, people who've right. been in town for a long time yep. too, which. Which I think is important because you know the, these are these are important decisions that you're all going to make. Right. So love yeah. to be part of that and uh, look right. forward to hearing from you. All right, great. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so, so much, much for coming. Much. In. <coughs> Sorry. Oh, that's right. Thank you, Thank you very much for coming. I don't even want a fist bump from her. <laughs> it is pretty contagious. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay. Yeah, I'm on the latter end of it. Don't. <laughs> <laughs> Have a good night, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So at this time, I propose, if it's the the wish of the board, um, to. Just take maybe a five to 10 minute recess. I know we've all been taking notes. We've all been writing things down. I know I have my, my own kind of rubric in which I had set up for each of the questions. Um, so I think maybe if we just take a brief recess um, in five and 10 minutes, come back to be ready to discuss the candidates. Does that sound appropriate? Mm -hmm. All right, so we'll take a five or 10 minute break and then we'll come back.